so I can so YouTube can find me. Oh, okay. Three, two, one, go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to round two of episode one nineteen. We're gonna call this software. <clears throat> excuse me, software updates. And after our second take, because our first take was brought to you by Time Warner Cable, if you need reliability, anybody else but Time Warner. So so today we, we really want to talk about software updates. We have some uh, password leakage, and Tom's going to go out and rant on a rant just at the end of the show, because if we start it, we may never hear the end of it. So let's first start off with, with uh, a LinkedIn database breach. So we've spoken about this years ago. I don't know if it was on this podcast, but I remember talking about this maybe to my students or something where LinkedIn linked uh, lost a whole bunch of data, user info, everything else. And it's bad enough that it was LinkedIn. But now we find out that a lot of people, a lot of famous people haven't changed their password. And most recently it hit the creator of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, where uh, he's now on Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook being owned by uh, by the hackers. Which is really odd. I mean, you, you think Mark Zuckerberg, right? It's like, okay, your grandma uses a, a really awful password and she uses it across every single site. Yeah, we get that. But Zuck? Zuckerberg? Really? Uh, I mean, you, the guy is obviously technologically literate, right? First off, Using a bad password in 2016? Okay, that's really bad. Reusing a bad password in 2016 across all your personal sites? Okay, using a bad password across all your personal sites and you run Facebook? Whoa, hold on here. Now, that bad password wasn't used in any Facebook properties uh, that we know of, but you know a bunch of his personal accounts across other sites were compromised for a short period of time until they reined him back in. But the fact that it happened doesn't look good for anyone. So we're, I'm just trying to find out maybe the silver lining here is, or the thing is maybe he just doesn't use Twitter. I mean, I don't follow him on Twitter. I guess I wouldn't follow him on Twitter and I'm searching. There's a whole bunch of Mark Zuckerberg's and not Mark Zuckerberg accounts that none of them are verified. So I think his is at F I N K D which doesn't make any sense, but the last tweet from what was from uh, January 2012. So maybe, you know what, if it's not Facebook, he doesn't care about it. Maybe. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, you know, when you're running Facebook, obviously you've got way better things to do than browsing around on LinkedIn or, you know, pinning stuff on Pinterest or tweet storming key pass on Twitter, which we'll get into later. That was a teaser. Um, yeah, I'm sure, you know, he's logged into his Facebook account. And he's got his Facebook credentials all locked away in a nice professional password manager. But, you know, you try not to forget about those other accounts, especially not when you run one of the biggest, most successful tech companies in the world right now. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's like we all do this. Oh, we don't care about this website. So here's a password that we commonly use. And if it gets compromised, who cares? But I guess... The problem is if you're famous, you also have to know security, which is really annoying. I mean, you're famous for something, not necessarily security. And now everything you need to do, you're going to be chased by paparazzi and everyone else trying to get any information that you want. So computer security or just any type of security becomes now a secondary job for you in addition to everything else. Right. You have to have your own personal security tech guy to follow you around and make sure you're not, you know, leaving sticky notes of your password all over your office. And it's not like it's Mark's job, but I mean, it's not like he doesn't know what he's doing. I'm sure he does. But it's one of those things that it's an afterthought in his case because he does have to run Facebook. He does have shareholders to respond to and and securing a Pinterest account is not necessarily the the, the best thing. And by the way, now I am happy that that I don't have a Pinterest account. because Because by the way, if you go to Pinterest, they make you log in. You can't just see awesome little ideas to showcase your birthday or something else unless you log in and give them information. Well, that's that's the new hotness in Silicon Valley. That's the, uh, the growth hacking technique of don't show them anything, don't give out an API, don't make it a nice public site that the world can use, make it all logins and paywalled and... Uh, 
So oh, it's back in my day, we went to web pages and we got the content without advertising, which is a lie because the web always had ads. Well, I remember back in my day, I used the internet using uh, a terminal and telnet. And it was just text. <laughs> it was black text on a white screen. And you had to walk uphill both ways to get your dial-up connection. That That's true. We had to hear the dial-up noise. We know what edge surfing was like all the time. There's a, there's someone who made a, a couple patches for various operating systems. When you're connecting to a new Wi-Fi network, it'll make the dial-up noise. It's really cool. I, I don't know if I need that. That, that. That's the problem. So, so yes, it's it's. we thought this LinkedIn data breach was over. It's still clearly going on. And now that there's renewed there's renewed activity, people are going to go back and, and do it. So if you are a victim of that, please go and change all your passwords. Get a password manager. I actually have LinkedIn to change my password every 90 days automatically, mainly because I don't really care about LinkedIn. But LastPass has an awesome feature where a lot of websites have a change my password every 90 days. And because I, I don't really care about it and I don't, I, I don't mind logging into LinkedIn, whereas Twitter and Facebook, I at least think I need to know the password just in case. So moving on from there, what was next? What else did we say? Let's see. Team next viewer. Up? Yes, team viewer. I don't know if this is specifically a team. So the, the article is, is that a uh, team viewer also lost data user accounts. The problem is, and this is why it's not necessarily related to team viewer, but any side of remote management is that it gave users basically physical access to a machine being virtual. And that's the thing we necessarily really want to talk about. Right. So a lot of businesses use TeamViewer. Um, I've used TeamViewer on some systems before we got, you know, real VPNs installed and we had to get into these boxes to set them up. You go to the physical box, set TeamViewer, and as long as you can talk to the internet, you can remote into it. It's really handy. Um, they've got a pro version that's, you know, more locked down, more features, and of course they charge for it. But everyone just installs the personal one and they say, well, it's not really for business. It's just kind of our backdoor into the system. Technically against the license agreement, and technically you are putting a backdoor to your system on the internet. Um, now, I have to say, I'm a big fan of TeamViewer. I love the application. I think they're great. Um, but let's be honest. We're you know basically throwing remote access. We're throwing physical access to our machines, console access, out onto the internet. Uh, and you have to take that with a grain of salt. You have to take that and say... Do I really need this? Should I go through the effort of setting up a VPN and RDP and getting things going the right way? And for most businesses, I'm not going to even the most, for some businesses, uh, they do that, right? TeamViewer is kind of a stopgap until they get the rest of their environment built. But um, the fact remains that there's a ton of machines out there, everything from personal machines to I have put TeamViewer on uh, relatives' computers that have chronic computer issues that I have to log in and fix things for them. That stopped since I've given everyone Chromebooks now. Um, but it used to be that I had TeamViewer everywhere uh, because I was the go-to guy to fix everything. Uh, and businesses are that way too. A lot of IT staff uses TeamViewer. So the fact that these hacks are going around, these breaches are going around, and people are logging into TeamViewer accounts and getting access to these boxes without people ever knowing, unless they're sitting and watching the thing, is pretty chilling. Uh, that's a pretty terrifying thing. Well, before we go into what exactly you can do with this, because we do say physical access. So TeamViewer installs itself and it wants to run all the time, which is always a problem. But like you said, it's if you're not at the computer, then accessing it, you, you can't turn on TeamViewer. So it makes sense to turn it on. And just like you, I do put it on my relatives' machines. It is awesome to help them fix things. And you can tell them to uh, to to like fit, not favorite you. I don't know what it is to put you on your their buddy list, so you can always have access. One of the things Team Viewer did that I liked is that it gave you a code. So if you connected to somebody's computer, it said, "Give me that code." So it was sort of a two step authentication. Not really, but you had to log in, you had to connect to the person, so they tell you how to get there, and then they had to read you the code. 
And if you were trusted, you can say automatically connect if you need to. So there was the first step. And I and I liked it because to set up remote desktop on your, your relative's machine is not a good idea. It's going to take too much time, too much effort. But if you're going to go between your computers, what I ended up doing is setting, like you said, set up remote desktop. Yeah, TeamViewer is absolutely fantastic because you know that your relatives are going to buy a new router and then your port forwarding or VPN config is just gone. Uh, they're they're going to run some update or check something and then the remote desktop stops working or they're going to remove the password because it's too annoying to log in every time and the remote desktop breaks then. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that can break remote desktop because it's designed to be, you know, sort of secure out of the box. I mean, RDD isn't the greatest protocol. I think the gold standard for remote access will always be SSH, um, even though that has had some problems in the past. Uh, but, you know, it's it's definitely more safe than, you know, throwing up VNC and letting it roam wild on the internet, as plenty of Shodan-based websites have showed us. Um, but the but, problem is, is that SSH is, you don't get the GUI. Right. You can figure the printer. This was the easiest way. And I'm always a big fan of default apps. So I'd always put remote desktop. But to explain how remote desktop works, and here's this button, click on it, and, and let it go is just so much easier. And then what if they're there, right? Or what if they're not there? What if it's the middle of the night and you're like, okay, look, I, it's, it's like Sunday night. I know my grandmother's asleep. I have to back up the family photos because her hard drive will go tomorrow if I don't back them up right now which does happen all the time. So run those backups. But, you know, there's there's maintenance you have to do. There's stuff you have to install. They'll call you in the middle of work and say, ah, oh, can you fix this? And you're like, oh, yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, but by the way, I'm in Florida, so can you fix this, like, before I get back? And then you've got to log in while they're not home. TeamViewer is great for that kind of stuff if you don't have a VPN set up with remote desktop. It's, uh, look, I like it. I do recommend it. But now here comes the problem. So, so TeamViewer had the leak where, where they found a way to access these machines. So your grandmother's machine, your machine, everything else. Now, the, what's the problem with that? Well, most people, remember, most people check the box, don't uh, remember me on this machine. All their two factor codes remember me on this machine. Well, now the bad guy is sitting on his or her couch accessing your machine as if they were there so obviously the first thing people do is go to the bank site first go to facebook see if that works if that works then let's go to the banking sites and seeing if we can get there because if we get to the banking sites we can clear out the money and it's always about money these days so getting there is or they could load up a bitcoin miner which i know has been done a ton after these team viewer hacks you know they'll throw in you know some kind of remote access tool that calls home to their server and they can log in whenever they want without team viewer uh throw in a bitcoin miner putting like a, a botnet agent you know basically just take your machine and make it do whatever they want uh because they're sitting there they're at your desk using your keyboard through team viewer uh and that's the dangerous part about this is you lose all of the security you have around you and keep in mind they're not just on your computer your computer sits on your network and they now have full access to anything you've done in your network. Do you save your router password in your browser? Yeah, well, they can get to that. Do you use a password manager that auto logs in, which you shouldn't auto log in LastPass, but do you? Well, now they have everything LastPass has access to. That could be a huge issue. Do you save your credit card details in Chrome? Well, there you go. Or, or, or in LastPass. LastPass. It doesn't have to. It, it whatever password manager you want, it's it's automatically there. Your cookies, everything, because they're there. Now, now if now for me, if you're encrypted and your computer goes to sleep, LastPass can operate. I don't think it can operate even if you weren't encrypted. I think the computer has to be on, or it has to get some sort of wake up. Uh, yeah, signal. Team Viewer has to. It will run when the computer's on. If it goes to sleep. Um, or if the machine's off, you just can't do anything with it. It's not like a um, a nice remote management package like uh, DRAC or ILO where you can uh, remotely turn on the machine from the internet, which, by the way, is the coolest thing for professional servers. If you have a server that's totally stuck and you need to remotely pull a power plug to log into an interface and grab the little power plug and yank it out and watch the server just die and then plug it in remotely. 
It's the coolest thing ever. If you haven't tried it, I highly suggest it. It's amazing. It's but again, this is again not limited to team viewer. This is a Chrome remote desktop or whatever log, log, log me in remote yep. desktop or any sort of remote desktop, even RDP on Windows or on Mac or whatever it is, because if they're getting access to it however they want, they can go there. Now team viewer does have two factor. Um I mean, Chrome also sort of has two factor. It's it's they generate it when you connect everything else, but but if you don't have two factor turned on, now is a good time to start looking into it and turning it on. And I do know that Chrome Remote Desktop, because I had to use that recently, will kick you off. Even if you're actively working on it, it'll boot you after a certain amount of time, like 15 minutes or something. And the person on the other side has to reauthorize your connection. Now, that could have been our bad connection, but it was truly annoying. And if I was an attacker, there's a lot I could do in 15 minutes, but it would be pretty annoying. Uh, I guess that's why the first thing you would do is install, you know, a remote access tool and that we've got persistent access to the machine. So it's, it's just one of those, just be aware. I don't save my last pass password. I have it periodically lo make me log in. I don't save the password. So you have to do it. Uh, I mean, I guess the good part is if you have a hardware token, like uh, the Ubico or, or something that you have to push, they're not going to have the ability to do that. But again, most people just have it saved in. Their passwords are saved. The cookies are there. So they don't even need to know the password. They just don't delete their cookies and it's there. So anything else? Anything else with that? I think that's about it. Any remote access is going to have risks. Uh, but right now, team is under heavy attack. They've lost some data in some way. I don't even know if we know the details behind that yet. But we knew, do know that several team viewer hack or team viewer team viewer users uh, are being hacked uh, and broken into. So for the moment, until they figure things out, you might want to back off a team viewer. Don't ha have it not start on startup. Um, look at something else for the moment. I'm sure they'll get it fixed, but uh, just be wary. Yes, I was going to say, uh, we're not saying team viewer is bad. We're just saying they lost data. And for until they fix it, just I would have it turned off and only turn it on when you know you need to have it on. Yep. Like, so, like, while you're using it, if you're going to go downstairs, you're going to leave the for the end of the day, maybe turn it on then. But try to keep it off when you don't need it, which is generally the, 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 the proactive rule for almost everything. The next thing that came out was automatic uh, the OEM updater. So when you uh, buy a new computer, you just bought the laptop we recommended. Now you have to start updating it, and they have – Windows update, but their own Lenovo or Dell or HP or Asus or Acer updates. They've been finding out that, yes, bad things are happening. Yeah. So apparently the vast majority of these applications, and these are applications that will come pre-installed on your machine. It's not something that you would go out and download. If you're reinstalling Windows, you're probably going to grab the drivers. You're not necessarily going to grab these update pack or these updates packages, uh, unless you're grabbing them because it makes a driver install easier, which I know people that have done that. Um, it turns out that these updater applications are pulling everything over HTTPS, and they aren't doing any verification whatsoever. And these utilities can download BIOS updates for your machine. That's the core. That's the heart of your machine. That's something that you can't easily wipe if someone gets in and mucks around with it. Now, BIOS level malware is fairly rare thankfully. Um, but, you know, if, if someone wanted to take the latest graphics card driver that this updater is going to pull down and install on your machine and replace that binary with something else, your updater will gladly accept it. The Dell and Lenovo updater will take it and say, oh, cool, it's a Windows installer. Plop, and it'll install anything that executable has to it. So if you're on open Wi-Fi, if you're on an untrusted network in, uh, in running these utilities, then hacker can man in the middle of that connection and throw anything on your machine that they want. And these updaters run with system level permissions. That's root level permissions. That is the, the highest level, you know, like president level permissions you can get on a system. You are God of the system at that point. Uh, so they could install and do anything they wanted to. Um, it's, it's really dangerous. You shouldn't use these utilities if you have uh, an OEM update utility, get rid of it. They're not worth having. It's 
And the scare the scarier part is most people when they get burned by an update vow never to update again. And it's a really bad thing. You, your phone update completely hoses the phone and Apple won't help you or, or Google won't help you. From then on, you're going to say, you know what? I'm never updating again with Windows, with anything. I will never update. So here, so here they are convincing an entire group of people after they get caught with something. And we can't even attribute it to an updater. It's just something happened. Now they see the Ask toolbar after they got a pop-up and they said, Okay, that pop-up was associated with Java. You know what? I'm never updating Java again because it's going to take 15 minutes of my time to get rid of. They're going to say, oh, this Lenovo thing? I know that I have to update Windows. Lenovo, I'm not updating that. And now we're left with all these old things. Yeah, this is this is an absolutely huge issue. Um, one of the things that you know security people, and we tell you a lot, is run your updates all the time. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't say, yeah, maybe next week, maybe in a couple weeks, I'll get to it eventually. Um, run the updates. There's security patches. There's bug fixes. Sometimes there's performance enhancements. You know, I, I run and I've been running Linux for a long time. Every time there's an update, I get excited because my computer is more stable and faster, depending on your distribution. I run Debian. Things get more stable as time goes on with Debian, which is great. Um, but these updaters and Apple breaking phones and KeyPass, as we'll find out, are teaching people that updates can be and sometimes are very bad. Sometimes meaning, you know, more than very occasionally. Sometimes meaning, yeah, it happens, but it's definitely not unheard of. Microsoft has been doing this for a while with the whole Windows 10 fiasco. Um, Software companies are training users to hate, loathe, and avoid updates. And that is exactly what we don't want to happen. That's exactly what makes these machines more insecure as time goes on. Uh, software is a brittle, fragile thing, and people are hammering on it all the time. The only way to stay ahead of the curve, the only way to keep these things safe, is to analyze it, find the holes, accept bug reports and say, hey, okay, look, you told me there's a problem here. I'm not just going to monkey patch it. I'm not just going to put a Band-Aid over it and call it done. I'm actually going to fix my software and provide an update. We need to tell users that these updates are a good thing, and we need to follow through with it. Forcing a Windows 10 update on people is not the way to do it. Forcing badly written OEM updater programs that install any binary that Joe Hacker at Panera Bread throws onto your machine is definitely not the way to do it. Well, Windows, what they're doing after the Windows 10 update is they're saying it's always going to be Windows 10. I think we're going to be Windows 10 for the next, for the long haul now. And all they're going to do is just push updates every second Tuesday of the month to try and get people to forget to want to allow the updates and to and to get easier access to market share in the sense that everything everyone's on the new version. They're essentially killing old versions of XP and Windows 7 and Windows 8 to get everyone on Windows 10. But again, people see once an update fails, that's it. And you're always, we're always told to do that, but who wants to do it when it's going to take, when Android has to optimize 150 apps and it's going to take 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and you can't do it overnight because your alarm clock is your phone. So now you have to sit there and wait, go to sleep, do nothing on your lunch break while you're tweeting. It's, it's one of these things that we have to, we have to solve this problem because updates are a thing and they're here to stay. Yeah, this is absolutely ridiculous. And I, I will say, I have to say, <clears throat> Microsoft making updates absolutely mandatory, saying, look, you're going to get the updates. You can push them off for a little bit, but you're getting the updates. That's a good thing. That's the place we need to get to. But do not, if you're building software, do not roll out updates the way Microsoft does. I was trying to play, I, I got a VR headset and I am super excited about it and it's awesome. And I spent way too much money, but um, I had to sit and wait for two hours, right? Because I hadn't turned on this Windows PC in about two weeks, two hours as it sat and it turned through updates and it failed five times. And every time it failed, it rebooted undid what it did, rebooted again, and then tried the update that failed all over again. And it did this until I went into save mode and said, get rid of the update. This is ridiculous. We shouldn't be doing this to people. 
Chrome does it right. Firefox does it right. Chrome and Firefox just pull it in the background. They install the update and they never interrupt you. In Chrome, if you leave a Chromebook on for long enough, it might have a red dot in the corner that says, hey, you should probably update because this update's sort of important. We'll get it when you restart. By the way, all of your tabs, everything you're doing, even the forms you filled in on a web page will be here when you get back. Just shut it off, turn it back on, it'll be done in literally five seconds. That is the way you run updates. And that's the way we need to get to with every other piece of software. The fact that we're not there today is hurting people security-wise. My wife got a Windows 7 refurbished laptop. And so the first thing I want to do with it, because it's not that important, she's looking at coupons, is put Windows 10 on it. So the first thing I did is, hey, get Windows 10. But I can't get Windows 10 until I update Windows 7. I can't update Windows 7 because it's the first, it's service, it's not even service pack one. The updater got updated. So I go through, like you said, 100 updates. It fails, and I don't know where it is. Turns out if you update the updater first, then everything works. But who knew about that? And it's just one of those horrible experiences. And I don't know what the solution is other than what you're saying. And I think Android is going to do something where it's going to download it on a separate partition or separately, test everything. And then when you reboot, it starts it up and switches over the partition. It's a little weird, but that's what it looks like Android N is going to do. That's how all network gear works. There's a TikTok update system where okay. you've got your running firmware and a second copy of your running firmware, but you're you're working on partition one. It takes your updates and slaps it down on partition two. And then next time you reboot the device, it tries to start up on two. If it fails, it knows it failed and it restarts back to one. And it says, it was a bad update. We're going to stay here for a little while. Try again later. It's great. It's how everything should work. Chromebooks work that way. They actually have, uh, last time I looked at the design doc, it was like six different partitions for firmware updates. So you can mess up five separate times and still have a working machine in firmware update land. It's amazing. It's just fantastic. Well, let's let's get to your, your rant. So the last story, and we save this for last, is that the key pass developer is not serving the update over HTTPS, which on one hand is super important. On the other hand, to me, not that important. But then you think about it, well, it's a key pass. It's a, it's a password manager. This has to be bulletproof. And you're trying to generate some ad revenue. You, you can't do that. Yeah. So we're, we're probably going to go over on this one. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm forewarning the audience. Uh, this will not be a nice, concise podcast this time. <laughs> um, but uh, a security researcher put out a great article, uh, CVE 2016-5119, Man in the Middle Attacks Against KeyPass 2's Update Check. Uh, and it's great. He's got a, a YouTube video here that's really short and sweet. Uh, shows him using Burp Suite, which is a great thing to get in between connections, to basically tell KeePass that, hey, there's another version here. You should download this binary that I have. And it works great. So KeePass, their website, does not use HTTPS. On top of that, they're still hosted on SourceForge which is a separate issue entirely, but the fact that they're still there says a lot. Uh, it's it's utterly lazy and really it makes me think less of a developer that they've still stuck on SourceForge and instead of using literally anything else. Uh, there are tons and tons of places you can put code now, um, but that's beside the point. The KeePass updater does not use HTTPS. It doesn't check or it didn't check for any sort of information on validity. Uh, the, the, best, the best thing it does is you can right click on the executable on the installer, go to properties and go to digital signatures and make sure that the signature is correct, which by the way, um, obtaining a digital signature is not hard, right? You can apply for one, you can buy one. It's like buying an SSL cert and you can sign any binary with it and call it basically whatever company you wanted to. It's not that hard to get a Windows code signing cert today. Uh, that should not be the last level of defense. And anyway, this person is asking users to right click a, a download 
the, okay, the running windows, you have to right click the installer, go to properties and dig through your way to get to the digital signature page and then make sure that it says what it's supposed to. Are you daft? Do we ask people to go whenever they go to Google to click and go to details and then click on security and then click on view certificate and then make sure that the common name, organizational, OU, serial number, and the issuer are all valid for the website they're visiting? No, that's ridiculous. We just expect it to work. We just know that if we see green HTTPS up there, it means we're good. And that's all it should take. This, this should be secure by default, not because it's a password manager, but because it's just software and it should be built correctly. But the fact that it's a password manager and it's not using encryption in the updater is absolutely ridiculous. Now, gonna breathe for a second <laughs> because this has been partially Band-Aid fixed. Not completely, just a little bit. All right. Rant part two. So KeePass put out uh, a message about this issue. They said, well, it's not really a vulnerability because they didn't really exploit anything. They just changed the version number. Okay, look, yeah, they didn't replace the EXE with something that would steal your passwords, but they could have is the point. Um, they said, okay, well, we're going to digitally sign the update information, the version information. And, and we're gonna serve the version information over HTTPS. Great, that's fantastic. A, for security software, having GPG signatures is great. You should totally do that. B, if you're serving the version check information over HTTPS, why don't you just put your binaries there? It's not that hard. Uh, apparently, so in in this article uh, by the original author, it does it has his timeline, and one of these items says, uh, you know, Dominic replied that the vulnerability will not be fixed. The indirect cost of switching to HTTPS, like lost advertisement revenue, make it an inviable solution. Okay, I don't know what kind of hokey ad provider you're running that doesn't use HTTPS but you're serving password management tools on the same page you're running these ads, which I got curious. So I checked out the page because I actually don't download KeePass from there. I get it from the Debian repositories, which by the way, I'm pulling over HTTPS because I configured it that way. Um, that page is serving Google ads over an HTTPS connection already. So I don't get where any lost ad revenue comes in unless there's some secret key pass download page I don't know about. This is absolutely ridiculous. There is no cost to switch to HTTPS. It will make your connections faster. It will enable HTTP2. It will work with your current ad provider. And by the way, you don't have to buy the certificates anymore. They just work. So I don't get where the disconnect is right now. Sure, you're signing the version information, that's great. You're sending version information over HTTPS, but you're still providing a binary plain text. And that's the biggest issue. This is a password manager. You make security software. You try to say you're being secure. This is ridiculous. If I wasn't pulling my version of KeePass from mirrors.kernel.org over HTTPS, I would go right back to LastPass right now. And if you're using KeePass on Windows, this is something for you to think about. I am recommending something that's closed source, proprietary, and owned by Logmian, mm -hmm. a company which has been known to utterly destroy any product they lay their hands on. And I'm telling you that you're probably better off there than with this open source golden boy that I've been using for a long time now. I love KeePass. I use KeePass every single day, but I don't understand where the technical gap is here. There is no reason for this, and it infuriates me. Look, I've we we've said if you want easy, use LastPass. We've said if you want to make sure the secure it, everything is as secure as possible, go to KeePass. And here we are saying, look, they're doing this really stupid error that could be solved in I don't know. I ran a Let's Encrypt certificate in fifteen minutes. Learning from scratch. It's it's really not hard. It's actually fun in a way. And if you can get and 
And if you know what you're doing, you obviously made a website. You made key pass. Like you, you didn't make that. You did all the right password things to install a Let's Encrypt certificate. It shouldn't be that hard. And I don't know. Is key pass that big? I don't think it's that big. I mean, as far as user base or, or code or no size. I, so if you're if you're serving it without a CDN from your site, oh, uh, it's I I will download it right now because it's there we go. Key pass two point three, and they're serving it from SourceForge, which again is an issue. So SourceForge serves it over HTTPS. Why doesn't the downloader do that? Okay, it's. It's three megs. I mean, this is this is nothing. This is hardly software by today's standards of you know throwing every wrapping everything in four hundred megabytes of JavaScript. Now, now you can you can make the devil's advocate point where do you want the features or do you want the security in the downloader? And I guess the answer is I want both. But first, work on the downloader before you you fix before the before you add features. To, to me, KeyPass is feature complete it does everything i want it to do it's got a notes field it's got username and password it stores them in an encrypted format it lets me use a pass uh, passphrase as well as a key file um it can handle uh you know one-time codes for google authenticator it's got a plugin system i don't know what else they could be doing uh, i'm sure they've got a feature list or a roadmap i could look at but i I don't get why this isn't a priority and I don't get why it's being ignored. They make security software. You think they would act like it. So, well, we are running long, so I think it's time to end. Agreed. So we will see everyone later. And if you want to hear Tom rant and rant and rant, follow him on Twitter. He'll go, he already tweet stormed it and everything else. So until next week, everyone, we'll see you later. Bye. Rant on. <laughs> Bye. And pause.